Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. This is Rocket Science, and today we will be looking at several updates in the space industry. Sometimes you hate to be right, and other times you'd love to be wrong. When I was working in the emergency room, a lady in her 30s came in with abdominal pain. This is a very common complaint, and while it can be serious, like appendicitis or an ectopic pregnancy, it usually turns out to be something much more benign. But as soon as I went into the room where she was and looked into her eyes, I knew this would not be one of those times. Her eyes had a yellowish tinge, what we call ictris, and her skin had a greenish-yellow coloration that we call jaundice. This told me that whatever was causing her pain had already effectively blocked the output of bile from her liver. This can be caused by gallstones, but I doubted she would have waited so long to come in. There could be strictures, but the same argument applies. She would have been in pain for months. So what else could it be? Cancer, one of the worst kinds, because by the time you get symptoms, it's usually too late. I was afraid this might be what she had, and when the ultrasound came back, sadly, I was right. I would have been much happier to be wrong. Steve Jobs developed this type of cancer also, though his was caught early, and he might have been saved if he hadn't listened to his friends who argued against surgery and chemotherapy. My point is, sometimes things are terminal, and there's nothing you can do. But sometimes, there is an opportunity to save lives. Not long ago, I gave my opinion that the Starliner was not safe to operate. I wish I had been wrong. It would be wonderful if America had two functional crewed spacecraft. I know it looks like the Orion will work out, and that's great. But it's a limited-use spacecraft, very expensive and best suited for deep space operations. We need more options for low-Earth orbit missions. A Starliner should have been an easy build. The Apollo Command Module was about the same size. Built by North American Aviation after being designed by a team led by Lou Givens, the Command Module could carry three people safely, not just to orbit, but all the way to the moon and back. Starliner was built to carry up to seven people, only to low Earth orbit, just like the SpaceX Dragon capsule. The Apollo capsule had a diameter of 12.8 feet, which is about 3.84 meters, with a volume of 218 cubic feet or 6.2 cubic meters. The Starliner is 15 feet in diameter, so about 4.5 meters, and at 3 meters tall, has about 11 cubic meters of volume. North American Aviation started working on the Apollo Command Module in 1961, and by 1968, it was ready to fly. Thirty-five of these were built, in two versions. Block 1 was mainly to be used uncrewed, with one crewed mission planned, while Block 2 would be used for crewed flights with the Lunar Module. It was a Block 1 version that caught fire in an all-oxygen environment during training, killing the Apollo 1 astronauts. Corrections were applied to Block 2, and 19 of these were launched into space between 1968 and 1975. Four were used for uncrewed flight tests, two suborbital and two orbital, with two more being used for crewed flight testing in orbit. Nine were used to carry 27 human beings to and from the moon, with the famous Apollo 13 accident turning that mission into an Apollo 8 style once around the moon and back. Apollo 10 was a dress rehearsal for a landing, and Apollos 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all made it to the lunar surface. Not the command module itself, but the lunar module, while the command module stayed in orbit, carrying the astronauts safely back home. Three more Apollo command capsules were used to get astronauts to and from Skylab, with the last one being used in 1975 for the Apollo Soyuz mission. After that, Apollo was retired. It had taken seven years from start of construction to a flying spacecraft. 
and these were in service for another seven. Starliner's construction started in 2010 with three being built, and a planned uncrewed test flight was scheduled for 2017, but this slipped to 2019, and we all know how badly that mission failed. The next launch was 2022, and while it succeeded in its mission to take cargo to the ISS, a lot of things went wrong. I've covered them before and won't repeat everything here, but I would like to point out that a software error almost caused a collision between the detached service module and the capsule itself. That software error was fixed just in time, and NASA somehow thought it was safe to send the next Starliner up with crew. I caught a lot of flack when I said the Starliner wasn't safe to operate, but NASA has now reached the same conclusion. This has left the astronauts on the ISS where, contrary to a lot of news stories, they are perfectly safe. I had said I wanted the Starliner to be detached from the ISS and flown back uncrewed, but we just found out that this is not possible. Boeing has admitted to removing from the spacecraft the software that had allowed the last partially successful flight, and loading software that does not allow autonomous operations. My question is this, how in the world is it okay to change the software on a ship that was almost destroyed because of a software error? Now we have a ship attached to the ISS that can only be flown away from it by human beings. NASA had wanted to hot fire and test the thrusters, as several had failed on this mission already. The system also had a helium leak that was downplayed, but I consider a very serious problem. So we have a spaceship attached to the ISS that is leaking helium any time they pressurize the manifold, which they must do to operate the thrusters, and is plagued by failing thrusters which, if not shut down manually when something goes wrong, could send the Starliner crashing into the ISS, potentially killing everyone on board. Right now, we have six spaceships docked to the ISS. This includes the Progress 87 and 88 Russian cargo ships, and the Soyuz MS-25, which can hold three people. There's also the Cygnus-21 that had some propulsion problems of its own, but made it safely to the station. And finally, we have the Crew-8 Dragon capsule, also called Endeavour, which can hold up to seven astronauts. While the Progress ships and Cygnus cannot carry anyone safely back to Earth, between Endeavour and Soyuz, everyone on the station can be put in a lifeboat. Here's my suggestion. Undock Progress 87. It's already delivered its three tons of supplies, and its expected design life is 180 days. It's been there for six months. Send it back on its own, since that ancient ship still has the software to do so. Then send up three Tesla bots on a Falcon 9 with another Dragon crew capsule. Configure these robots for remote operation from Earth, where Starliner-trained astronauts will use VR equipment to see through the robot's eyes. Now the ship can be detached from the ISS and safely operated remotely, yet manually. It can move a safe distance away and then lower its orbit, returning to Earth with the robots on board. That would leave two Dragon capsules and a Soyuz attached to the ISS. A lot of people have criticized the development of humanoid robots, arguing that other design options would be more efficient. I disagree. Our modern world is made for human beings, and the best use of humanoid robots is to take our place in situations too hazardous for people. While they don't yet have the autonomous capability to operate a spacecraft on their own, under remote control, they are the perfect solution to this problem. Something to think about. And like I said, sometimes I'm happy to be wrong. In my recent analysis of the Raptor 3, I seriously underestimated its capabilities. SpaceX announced that the new Raptor 3, whose elegant simplicity I commented on last week, has performance metrics far exceeding what I had hoped. I had listed its thrust at 230 metric tons force, or 2.26 meganewtons, but probably I should have used 250, and had assumed it would have the same efficiency, 330 seconds of specific impulse at sea level, as the Raptor 2. But according to the newly released specifications, the Raptor 3 will now have 280 metric tons force of thrust and 350 seconds 
of specific impulse for efficiency. Let's see what this changes. If we assume 33 engines firing at 230 tons force, we get a total thrust of 7,590 tons. If we use a 1.5 thrust to weight ratio, that allows us to get a 5,060 ton mass off the launch pad. The booster has a dry mass goal of 180 metric tons and a propellant mass of 3,400 metric tons, giving a total of 3,580. A Starship fully fueled has a dry mass of 120 and a propellant mass of 1,200 for a total of 1,320, leaving 160 metric tons of payload. At 330 seconds of specific impulse, how much delta V can it generate? We start with a launch mass of 5,060 metric tons and burn 3,350 metric tons of propellant leaving some to come back and hover and land on the tower arm. Using the rocket equation, this gives us a delta V of 3,512 meters per second. Now let's try the new Raptor 3. With 280 metric tons times 33 engines, we can now produce a thrust of 9,250 tons. That, using the same thrust to weight ratio of 1.5, gives us a potential launch mass of 6,160 metric tons. That's 1,100 metric tons more than with the Raptor 2. That is why Elon has been talking about 250 metric tons to orbit. Now let's check the delta V. Using our new specific impulse, if we launch with this entire mass, then the propellant mass of the booster is not as high a fraction of the total mass. So we know off the bat that we might not produce as much delta V, even with the higher efficiency. Going from 330 seconds of specific impulse to 350 takes us from an exhaust velocity of 3,237 meters per second to 3,434 meters per second. With our new launch mass, burning the same 3,350 tons of propellant, we end up at burnout with 2,810 tons of mass, and that gives us a delta V of 2,695 meters per second, about 2.7 kilometers per second. Of course, this is not really practical. In reality, We'll stretch the propellant tanks on the booster and those on the Starship, just as SpaceX has announced they plan to do. But for today's exercise, let's keep it like it is and drop the payload to, say, 300 metric tons, more than doubling the performance of the most powerful and efficient rocket to ever fly a payload to orbit. If we add up the dry mass and propellant mass of the booster and Starship, we get 4,900 metric tons. Add in our 300-ton payload and we get 5,200. We burn our 3,350 and burn out at 1,850 tons. That gives us a delta V of 3,548 meters per second, beating our previous 3,512. Nothing we have seen fly yet is actually a true super heavy booster or starship. They are just prototypes for testing. Just like the evolution of the Raptor engine, Starship will go from a clumsy and inefficient system to an elegant and dependable new category of rocket, the ultra heavy lift category, which I think should start at 250 metric tons. Innovations like this will indeed move humanity off the earth and on to all the worlds available to us in our solar system, and someday on to the stars. Something to look forward to. Thanks for listening. Thank you for all your support on Patreon. And stay safe at Astro Proterra.